Thank you, Courtney, and thank you everyone for uh, tuning in today to this session. Uh, joining me on the program today is Dan Levinson, uh, the former Inspector General of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where he served from September 8, 2004, until he resigned on May 31st in 2019. Uh, we intend on covering uh, a number of topics over the course of the next uh, hour and a half. Uh, there is a place for you to submit questions uh, that, and we will entertain questions uh, during the last segment of the hour and a half for the last 15 minutes. So if everyone's ready, uh, we'll, we'll get started um, and, and commence our discussion. Uh, on the screen is uh, the topic areas generally that, that we intend to cover. Uh, we probably will uncover uh, other uh, topics in addition to the ones listed there on that slide deck, uh, but that will give you a pretty good um, roadmap for uh, where we'll be going with the discussion. Also, I would uh, like to um, uh, uh, commend you to the written materials that are submitted uh, along with this program, which are a variety of different uh, sources and authorities that uh, also give a, a good idea of what the role and responsibilities are of the Inspector General and what some of the programs that they've initiated uh, in the healthcare space. So with that, let me start by uh, asking Dan, uh, why don't you tell us, Dan, a little bit about your background and experience, which uh, ultimately led to your appointment as the Inspector General of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you, Gabe, and I'm delighted to join you for, uh, for this session and a warm welcome to our viewers and our listeners. Chances are I've met a number of uh, the folks who are on, uh, with the program today over the course of years and a distant and warm hello uh, to them. Uh, happy to give you a, uh, a, a quick review of uh, the career before I, I joined HHS. I spent nearly the first decade out of law school in private practice, and the, both the private practice and then the subsequent uh, federal practice um, for the 80s and 90s was predominantly in employment law and doing a wide variety of labor management relations, um, civil rights law under Title VII uh, in the private sector, and then in the public sector. Uh, Deputy General Counsel of the Office of Personnel Management, uh, General Counsel of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and in the mid-80s, I was appointed by President Reagan uh, to be chairman of the Merit Systems Protection Board. Uh, so in effect, I was uh, something like the chief judge of the civil service system for a seven-year term that uh, took me through the entire term of President George H.W. Bush and actually even the first half year or so of President Clinton. So technically I've also, I served under the last three administrations of the 20th century uh, because the MSBB term actually went from 86 to 93. Uh, I briefly served as a chief of staff on, uh, in Capitol Hill uh, when uh, the 104th Congress convened and uh, was up there on the hill during the deliberations over HIPAA, uh, which gave me, uh, I think, some important familiarity, especially with the anti-fraud sections of HIPAA, uh, because the member that I was with uh, was a member of the House Judiciary Crime Subcommittee. So uh, our office was involved in, um, in that law and in, in that part of the law. Uh, when the Bush administration came in, in the early 2000s, uh, I was appointed Inspector General of the General Services Administration, uh, which gave me uh, oversight authority of the federal civilian procurement system. And uh, as part of the GSA portfolio, um, the Federal Supply Service, which is a government-wide uh, service in which various and sundry supplies throughout the government are, are furnished, uh, also included some very important parts of the veterans' affairs and the veterans' hospital system. Uh, so it gave me some exposure as well to the federal veterans' hospital system while I was there. Um, in 2004, 
uh, I was uh, asked to assume the position of Inspector General at HHS as the previous Inspector General, Janet Rehnquist, had, had left office in the summer of 2003. And for a while, I actually served as the, uh, as the acting HHS IG uh, while I was pending confirmation. Uh, which took uh, seven or eight months. So I was uh, the head of the office beginning in the fall of 2004, actually appointed HHSIG in the spring of 2005. So, so Dan, let me, let me ask you something about that. I mean, um, you were appointed. It, it, do you apply for that position? You, do you get nominated? Do you have a guardian angel or a sponsor? Right. How does that work generally, and how did it work for you? Uh, you know, there really is no um, there is no formal process when it comes to presidential appointments, which this one is. Um, presidential appointments are the prerogative of the president, as you as you might assume. And how that is structured for me, from one White House to another. Uh, really is a matter of how uh, the personalities, how the incoming administration wants to handle it. But based on service, in one form or another, through six administrations, uh, I would say that there is uh, a, a relatively straightforward uh, involvement by an office of presidential personnel that gathers candidates and discusses and considers who should be recommended to the president for nomination when it comes to these kinds of senior positions. And the HHS IG, like IGs for the rest of the cabinet departments and some of the other major agencies like GSA, are positions in what's called the executive schedule. And they are high ranking enough so that they are in effect constitutionally principal civil officers of the United States. And they need to be uh, nominated by the president and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So the process is the same for uh, a cabinet department secretary or for a federal judge. Uh, we're all civil officers. And, and because we're principal civil officers, as opposed to inferior civil officers, that's the language of the Constitution, which allows department heads to appoint those people. If you're a principal civil officer, the Constitution says you're going to go through the nomination and the confirmation process. And, and it's, it's really the PPO, you know, how it goes about making the selections. I'm sure there are people who do apply, and there are instances and plenty of occasions when the president has people already in mind. So it's, it's, uh, it's a mixture of the president's preferences uh, the president's solicitation you know, from the office of who would be suitable for appointment and as to how the various candidates are gathered. It's a idiosyncratic process. That's about as clear as I can share with you, Gabe. Well, I, I guess it didn't hurt that you had uh, not only broad-based government experience through a number of administrations, uh, but but also... IG experience at, at the General Services Administration, that, which is yeah. no small qualification for any IG position, right? That's, that's, that's true. And the reason, at least part of the reason why I wound up at GSA was based on my experience earlier in my career at OPM, at the CPSC, and especially at the MSPB, the Merit Systems Protection Board. All of these positions not the CPSC, but the OPM uh, and MSPB, as well as IG positions, are all found in Title V of the U.S. Code, not a title that most lawyers have occasion to deal with unless you're doing Privacy Act or FOIA. But Title V provides the architecture of how the executive branch is structured. And those positions are the ones that really require knowledge, experience, background in the infrastructure of government and how government works. And the incoming Bush administration selected me for the IG portfolio, I have no doubt, uh, in significant part because I was already familiar with government operations. And GSA, of course, is one of the premier government operation agencies. 
And for any kind of management position that deals with the infrastructure of government, and the HHSIG certainly does, that kind of background would be very suitable. Um, so I, I want to get into maybe a little bit later, um, uh, you know, who you're accountable to uh, uh, in the agency, in the White House, et cetera. Uh, but before I do that, um, you know, your your tenure at at the OIG HHS spanned uh, more than a decade, and it, it included uh, three different uh, presidential administrations, which um, in these times is uh, something I think you should put on your resume, uh, no matter what. But but can you tell us a little bit about? Uh, what maybe uh, was different in in the in the scope and responsibilities and initiatives in your role as the IG from maybe one administration to the other? How, what are some of the things that you know kind of change from one administration to the other? And what was your experience with that? A great a great question, and we, we've uh, we've talked about this I know in the past, and uh, I've given it some thought. Um, you know, before I, I think about the important issues, I'm very pleased, very happy uh, to look back and, and reflect on what a positive relationship I had with a half a dozen different secretaries, starting with Tommy Thompson um, toward the end of uh, the first term of the Bush administration when I came in. But it's, uh, I've, I've really been blessed, and I think the OIG has been blessed at HHS with HHS secretaries, both parties who have come in and have been well credentialed uh, in many cases with experience that's very relevant uh, to the department. And uh, they've really been a pleasure to work with, notwithstanding the independence and the need to be separate from those offices. And uh, also been very fortunate dealing with deputy secretaries who are, are also tend to be experienced and easy to work with and really know their stuff. And that was true uh, in all of the administrations uh, that, I, that I served. That made it a lot easier. Um, I've, I've thought about the differences in each administration. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a famous line in Shakespeare that's what's past is prologue. And... I, I think that I could I could kind of compact the, the the key issues of each administration that OIG dealt with uh, in terms of a three act play: uh, Bush, Obama, Trump. And I would include three scenes on each one. And if you give me a few minutes, we can go through this quickly, and I think then we can drill down on some of the issues. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Act one, scene one would be the MMA, Part D. You know, the arrival of the new Part D benefit was really the significant achievement domestically uh, for the Bush administration uh, in the first term. That law uh, was passed toward the end of 2003 before I arrived. But when I did arrive in 2004, 2005, it was after the enactment of Part D, but before uh, the implementation of the law, which was scheduled for 2006. So the uh, OIG was very involved when I came in, in preparing a pr appropriate oversight uh, for Part D, which, uh, you know, for those who are familiar with that end of, uh, uh, of the Medicare program, is an unusually complex uh, arrangement. Uh, it's... Uh, it involves so much of private sector uh, components like the pharmacy benefit managers, as well as the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, it provides a rather complex arrangement. So uh, that's scene one. Uh, scene two, I would, I would label the DME task force. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was a uh, significant increase in fraud schemes in South Florida, uh, in your neighborhood. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, phony storefronts uh, selling or pretending to sell DME. And when I arrived early in my tenure, 
this was put on my screen as a very important issue to tackle as soon as possible. And I have a very distinct recollection of going down to South Florida early in my tenure with Lou Morris, the then chief counsel, and working not just with our South Florida office, but with law enforcement partners uh, to come up with a task force that would tackle uh, the incredible growth in fraud that was going on in that part of the country. And indeed, the, the task force that was arranged between OIG and our partners turned into regional task forces that were then perpetuated in other parts of the country. Scene three uh, for Bush, I would, I would say the, um, the development of uh, safe harbors under the, under the anti-kickback statute for electronic health records, interoperability, the, the, the notion of trying to make it easier for providers to donate um, computers, various electronic uh, health assets uh, to doctors uh, so that uh, this is very early in, in the stage of trying to create a more integrated health system based on new developments in technology. And early on, uh, OIG was involved uh, actually with the then Deputy Secretary, Alex Azar, uh, with uh, coming up with uh, new safe harbors uh, to permit and, in effect, encourage the donation of electronic health records uh, systems so that we could get a, a, fast, a, a fast start to interoperability. Um, Obama. Act two, scene one, I would label as the HEAT initiative. Uh, the HEAT initiative, and that's an acronym for, in effect, the task force that we started in the Bush administration, but OIG then with additional resources that were provided by the Obama administration, really took the regional task force idea nationwide so that various fraud schemes, whether it was infusion therapy, home health, uh, DME, the, you know, the particular kinds of, of frauds that were, that were happening in Detroit, Houston, Los Angeles. Uh, it, it allowed OIG to work on the ground uh, with other partners, with the Department of Justice, with state and local authorities, to create a much more robust system for being able to tackle frauds around the country. Uh, Act two, uh, scene two, uh, would be the passage of the High Tech Act as part of the Recovery Act. You may remember that in 2009, as Obama comes in, uh, there is a huge uh, law passed to try to get the, uh, the economy moving again. And a very significant part of that was the High Tech Law, uh, the high tech law that, that made statutory the uh, original office of the national coordinator that had been created during the Bush years and really develop a far more sophisticated effort uh, to, uh, to include interoperability, to integrate systems, uh, to be able to provide the kind of uh, sophisticated data forensics and analysis that in turn would allow CMS, OIG, and many other components around government to be able to use data in a far more effective way. Um, Act two, scene three, I would say, of course, is the Affordable Care Act, which follows on the following year. I'd say act two, scene three kind of steals the show because the Affordable Care Act really sets out what's going to be a very significant uh, agenda uh, for the rest of the decade. And here we are at the end of the decade and we're still uh, working with the ACA, and uh, there, uh, there, there looks to be uh, real legs going into the 2020s on many significant parts of the ACA, regardless of who holds what part of the government politically. Um, the ACA was especially important operationally for OIG uh, as a result of Title VI, which provided great strengthening of our anti-fraud tools, um, which we can go into. But uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of talk about uh, the parts of the ACA other than Title I, the exchanges in the more public uh, arena. But indeed, as, as people in this field know, uh, the ACA has 10 titles. 
uh, most of which are still operational. Uh, the uh, uh, one or two are basically dead letters, but um, Title Three and Title Six. Title Three being the uh, the title that allowed the Medicare Shared Savings Program and a lot of these new models uh, to be used uh, with fraud waivers. And Title VI, which, which provided very important anti-fraud vehicles, th those really uh, were exceedingly important to OIG operations throughout the decade and continue uh, to be very significant. On Trump, Act Three, uh, scene one would be 2017, when uh, Dr. Tom Price leaves the Hill to become Trump's first HHS secretary. Uh, Dr. Price in 2017 comes in, uh, he embarks on a, uh, a, uh, many trips around the country uh, to talk to uh, providers and those interested parties about what might replace the Affordable Care Act. Uh, in doing so, uh, a lot of charter planes are arranged uh, for these trips and Dr. Price gets into uh, problems in terms of just the, the his, his, his personal conduct in how those in how those trips were arranged. Uh, 2017 is really absorbed with Dr. Price coming in and Dr. Price leaving. Uh, so uh, we go quickly to scene two when Alex Azar, who as I mentioned earlier had been deputy secretary, we had worked with in the in the second term of the Bush administration, becomes secretary, and uh, Alex also is uh, is deeply involved in probing about how we can best replace the Affordable Care Act. And again, the focus is very much politically on on Title One concerning the exchanges, which really don't fit the federal health care program profile. Uh, they're really outside of our typical federal health care programs. Not that we don't have jurisdiction in terms of the structure and operation uh, in, in part, but um, Title I is, 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 is not a preoccupation, I would say, of OIG. Uh, but uh, that, that year uh, is, a, is an important year in which Azar comes in and we begin to work on on how we can, again, make most effective the Affordable Care Act, in effect, with whatever replacements might be considered. Uh, Act three um, is, uh, you know, sometimes Shakespeare kills off actors before the play is over. Uh, scene three is, is, is uh, COVID and the CARES Act and what has transpired essentially since I left. Uh, so uh, my tenure ends at uh, Act Three, Scene Two. So, so Dan, um, it sounds like in in uh, a lot of the uh, different acts and different scenes that the OIG was basically taking uh, cues uh, from uh, the 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 instruction of legislation out of Congress. Um, with, with maybe the possible exception, you mentioned the early DME initiative. How did how did that arise? What was the source of hey, we need to we need to um, put some priority and attention to to the DME sector of the healthcare industry? Well, as I as I come in, that that is already something that is in the. Uh, uh, that OSIG and the special agents down in South Florida have identified just in terms of the mounting false billings that are occurring. I mean, CMS sees it. And uh, this becomes not just a, a kind of a routine part of our Office of Investigations work, but the South Florida office is, is ringing three alarms. Uh, by the time uh, I come in in 2004 and five, saying, you know, we have a tremendous increase in these phony storefronts. Mm -hmm. and the DME buildings are off the charts. And no matter how you slice and dice the data, there is simply no way that they can be justified. Even at that early stage of technology, uh, there are people within the department who can look at uh, building trends and say, this is aberrant to the extreme. Uh, yeah. there, 
there has to be some very bad things happening down there. So I, I think it's a focus that already is beginning to gel as I arrive. Um, and, and I credit a, a number of the people in the office, both in Washington and in South Florida, who uh, are not simply letting this be business as usual and simply asking for an uptick in resources, but are saying, we, we really need a strategic response to what might historically have been a tactical problem, but now has really gone out of control. But, but so it sounds like, though, that uh, that was identified as, as a priority from uh, from people with boots on the ground at the at the IG, as opposed to being an overriding uh, objective that was uh, transmitted by Congress. Correct. I mean, I, I w- was not getting that sense other than internally. Now, whether internal folks were hearing it from others, I fortunately, uh, I think that we have uh, the OIG has a very good grapevine among law enforcement personnel. There's a lot of uh, conversation that occurs both at the law enforcement level and at the administration, at the administrative level between uh, our, our the, the program people at OIG who look at it, who evaluate programs and whether there uh, whether there are problems and CMS which also has a robust management and operation issue. To what extent CMS and OIG were already talking about this, uh, I don't have a clear recollection, but it was very much on the minds of enforcement people, both the investigative and the council in the early 2000s. And yeah, I, I do recall um, uh, some former, uh, you know, I've been around long enough to remember these days, uh, and I do remember uh, some what who are now former assistant U.S. attorneys in in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami uh, talking about uh, the incidents of, of fraud in the DME sector. And I remember in particular being told by one of the attorneys that in a case that uh, she was investigating with uh, the I- IG agents, I guess. Um, uh, the address for a DME company turned out to be like the fifth hole at the Doral Golf Course. <laughs> uh, you know, just to add on, you know, the, I guess the legacy of that initiative that was what? What's that? Twenty years ago, I guess. Uh, well, it's 2007, so it's about 13 years ago. And I remember going down to South Florida and having a press conference with Alex Acosta, the. Yeah. Uh, the former sure. labor secretary and at that point, the U.S. attorney uh, to talk about fraud takedowns like this. Yeah, uh, well, DME uh, takedowns uh, are continue. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, the DME uh, uh, business and, and the uh, combined with uh, new versions of telemedicine are keeping me very busy. Mm hmm. That hasn't ended. Um, so let, let me switch gears a little bit. Uh, so you're you're the inspector general of HHS. Uh, the department has a secretary. You're basically nominated, appointed by the White House with consent. Uh, who do you answer to? Who are you accountable to exactly? Well, as a as a civil officer of the United States, I'm always accountable to the president. Um, as as long as I'm in the executive branch, uh, civil officers in the judicial branch are are accountable to Congress through the impeachment and conviction process, but uh, they're good, uh, you know, for good behavior. In the executive branch, uh, for a position like this, there's always accountability to the president. The president hires, and the president fires. So there, there's no doubt that the president can fire an inspector general of any uh, federal agency. That is true. Okay. That is true. Um, there have been some amendments fairly recently that uh, are supposed to give um, IGs like 30 days notice before being removed from payroll. But, the, but, in a, but as a practical matter, presidents uh, have discretion uh, to fire inspectors general. They're supposed to give a reason to Congress, but uh, the reason is entirely up to the president. 
uh, I mean, if if the president doesn't like the tie that the IG is wearing, um, the IG goes. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's there, there's really uh, no standard for it. How would you describe uh, the IG's relationship to uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services? Yeah, that, that's a that's an interesting, uh, somewhat textured relationship because the Inspector General Act has language that indicates that the IG should uh, should have a something of a general reporting relationship to the head of the agency. In other words, there's an understanding in the statute that there should be uh, some effort by the IG uh, to both respond to an agency head and to keep the agency head in the loop about what the IG is doing. But the, the, uh, the language is put in very general terminology. So it's never been construed as allowing an agency head to really direct an independent inspector general. And there is language specifically uh, prohibiting an agency head from uh, telling an IG that the IG should not investigate something that is jurisdictionally within its purview. Got it. Um, you, you talked about uh, the different uh, uh, priorities and initiatives from administration to administration. Uh, were there other priorities that you identified uh, during your tenure that, that you know, didn't involve those different acts and different scenes that maybe were generated uh, internally or from other sources or, or that, that you had the agency sort of directed and pursued? Uh, well, early on, Gabe, I was uh, I was encouraged by counsel's office and others at the OIG uh, to be involved with compliance as an as an important portfolio uh, for the OIG uh, to promote. But by the way, I don't want to interrupt you. But at, since you mentioned the counsel's office, um, in in 1985, um, I was uh, a trial attorney in the uh, Social Security Division of the Office of General Counsel of HHS. And I was recruited to apply for the position of uh, deputy counsel mm. uh, for HHS in the Dallas region. And um, uh, I was uh, appointed to that position, and in preparation for that position, uh, of course, my scope of responsibilities now involve the other agencies in the department. And so I, I scheduled a visit to the Office of Counsel of Inspector General, which then was the Office of Inspector General Division of the General Counsel's Office. Uh, to talk to the attorneys there and the leadership and and get an idea of what they would expect of me being a deputy counsel out in the Dallas region. And so I, I visited in the Cohen building. And when when I was there, uh, there were, if you included the then uh, general counsel and the deputy and the other lawyers, there were six lawyers in the office of counsel of inspector general. How many lawyers approximately were in the Office of Counsel of Inspector General when you got there? Uh, the office probably had about 60, and now it probably has about 70 or 75. I mean, right. it's a good size law firm embedded in the OIG, the only OIG that has a law firm embedded in it. Oh, wow, really? I, I don't think I knew that. Well, the, the law does require, and this is, again, uh, one of the amendments from about 10 years ago, that uh, IG should, uh, every IG should have a chief counsel. And the idea there was to ensure the independence of offices of inspector general in terms of not relying upon the legal opinions of the agency office of general counsel. Yeah. Uh, they, they wanted IGs to have their own counsel. But in terms of the resources, um, many IG offices are a handful of people, and then there are others that 
more often than not or somewhere between a handful and something as large as HHS. And there'll be a chief counsel and perhaps uh, a couple of more lawyers, but no OIG has a 60 or 70 uh, member, in effect, law firm uh, in the office. And, and that really has so much to do with the special authorities that the yep. HHS IG has. You know, as a, as a general matter, the Inspector General Act says the Inspector General's office should not run or administer any program of the agency because if you're running a program, you can't oversee it in terms sure. of being an independent and objective. That said, um, you know, some of the authorities, like the ability to assess the civil monetary penalties, uh, some of these uh, affirmative kinds of powers that the HHSIG have, um, you know, arguably are exceptions to the Inspector General Act and create, you know, a significant need for legal resources that no other I, 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 IG can, can possibly use. Uh, before we um, talk a little bit more about the compliance initiative, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, enforcement. Um, so the Inspector General uh, has the um, uh, exclusion authority, the civil money penalty authority. Um, how has the uh, enforcement uh, component of the inspector general's uh, authority and and job description if you will evolved over over your time and 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 what are some of the things that that you think have been accomplished in the enforcement sector uh, over the time period that you've been observing it well the, the the problem of healthcare fraud is a perpetual one it's it's not something that uh, that really waxes and wanes all that much. It's a, what the military would call a target rich environment because you invariably, given the amount of money and uh, the, uh, the, the number of sectors of the economy involved in healthcare, uh, you're going to have risk. You're gonna have fraud risk um, in virtually every corner. And uh, the office has always had hundreds of criminal investigators at this point, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's it's probably numbering about uh, 450, maybe even 500. But there, it, it has a significant cadre of investigators who, again, unlike most other IG offices, usually have some background in healthcare uh, because these are, relatively speaking, specialized cases, and. Uh, the, the the enforcement function is is just fundamental uh, to every IG office, but with respect to HHS, given the enormous dollars that are involved, it's an especially critical function that requires a very sophisticated response, both in terms of the FTEs, the people that you get, as well as the various tools that are used, the kinds of data analysis that's required. Um, especially these days, uh, if I had to note one, the, the biggest change over the decade and a half I was there, it would be the use of data analytics, the, the ability now of investigators to be able to quickly, almost in real time, working with CMS, be able to get data uh, that gives them very quick direction. Uh, about e emerging fraud trends and fraud schemes. So I, I think that is the most dramatic increase with respect to law enforcement. Um, there are you know, specific kinds of, of activity that do you know, mushroom at times. I'm thinking now about the early 2000s when I came in, there was significant activity on the pharmaceutical front uh, with kickbacks, uh, you know, because of whining and dining of physicians by pharma reps and uh, mislabeling, um, rather, you know, the marketing of uh, of of, uh, of drugs uh, that were uh, that were not approved for that purpose by FDA. So between the labeling uh, cases and the kickback. Uh, the OIG was involved in multi-billion dollar settlements uh, for a considerable part of the first six or seven years that I was at the office. That, you know, as, as compliance became a, a much more 
uh, professional uh, field in which pharmaceutical companies uh, needed to get up to speed and in many cases really did, uh, th- th- those cases became rare. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you just don't see that part of the portfolio that loomed so big during you know, many of my first years. Uh, yep. That is a far more modest part of the portfolio now. I, I, so yeah, I remember those cases, and and I, I remember there was um, initially frustration uh, because of uh, pharmaceutical company recidivism in these mm-hmm. uh, kickback arrangements. But um, we haven't heard of those cases much in the last five or ten ten years. I think mm-hmm. uh, at their day, and I, I I presume that means that those kickback activities uh, have more or less ceased to exist. Do we have any way of knowing that, that that's actually the case? (laughs) Yeah, I would be hesitant to uh, make any blanket statement. Um, And, uh, you know, a a lot of these cases, Gabe, uh, were surfaced by whistleblowers. I mean, it's important uh, to underscore, I think, the significance of uh, the key TAM provisions and the uh, the important role that whistleblowers played in effect teeing up these cases uh, you know the, there were really two districts that became famous uh, for handling these and that was the district of massachusetts in boston and the eastern district of pennsylvania in philadelphia i mean in those years those were the go-to districts uh, for uh, for the litigants, you know, to file their cases, and uh, our auditors became quite expert in those in those uh, OIG field offices in Boston yeah. and in, in Philadelphia in sorting out you know, these kinds of cases. So, uh, you know, at a certain point, um, it, it became uh, obvious to many in my position in in private practice that. Uh, the Office of Inspector General uh, and the Office of Counsel of Inspector General were uh, assuming more and more of a, a lead leadership role in promoting compliance oversight for healthcare organizations. I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, uh, how how that that initiative arose and and what was the thinking, both by you and the organization in in promoting that agenda and, and what were maybe the goals and objectives or, or what may still be the goals and objectives. Hmm. In terms of compliance. Yes. Efforts, yeah. Um, well, once again, I'd say that that was on the screen when I arrived um, early on after HIPAA, uh, June Gibbs Brown, uh, the, the IG at the time signed um, a um, self-disclosure protocol reg, I think it was 1998, uh, and explained to the industry, perhaps in a letter, about the uh, the importance of, uh, of of compliance and of working with the OIG. And I think that there was uh, a, an open letter as well by Jenna Rehnquist, my predecessor, uh, back in 2001. And in fact, I think these are still on the HHS OIG webpage if you go into the history. Um, When I arrived, I was encouraged by the office to make this a priority and to be involved uh, with, you know, those who had joined in associations like the Health, uh, the Healthcare Compliance Association and, uh, and some of the work that was also being done by the ABA and the AHLA. and I, I think a lot of the motivation, was, well, th- I think there were two issues at least. Uh, one issue was the, the HIPAA law, the law that really created the modern HHSIG. And, and I appreciated your stories about the 1980s because pre-1996 um, and before Social Security was carved out of HHS in the mid-90s, um, you know, what you were doing in the, in the 80s was really the bread and butter of the IG office. It was Social Security. Uh, it was the 800-pound gorilla, you know, within the department. And that was the work. 
And it was a more traditional IG operation. It didn't, it, it had not consolidated all of these anti-fraud uh, major efforts that were put into HIPAA, like the healthcare fraud account, uh, in which millions of dollars were dedicated to a joint effort by HHS and DOJ to tackle healthcare fraud. And within that law itself, it made clear that, you know, the HHS IG should issue advisory opinions, uh, look for ways to partner with the private sector in being able to tackle healthcare fraud. I mean, again, uh, you go back to the organic legislation and you're being told this, this is an important part of what the, the basket of responsibility should be for the OIG at HHS. And so it's there. Now, of course, the question is what you will do with it. Do you have the resources to do something important with it? And uh, are you trying to? And it was clear when I came in, and that would be, you know, seven or eight years after the, after the law, that uh, the IG was saying the right things, but um, there wasn't necessarily uh, the kind of focus on this issue uh, from the front office all the way down that uh, clearly was needed uh, to be able to tackle what, again, looked like a very, like a significant growing fraud problem uh, in parts of the country and dealing with a highly complex regulatory field um, like the one we deal with, with Medicare and with Medicaid. And even before I was confirmed, while I was pending and serving as acting, uh, people encouraged me to consider the invitation from HCCA to speak at the annual meeting, I think in 2005. I couldn't, I didn't feel I, I, I could do that because I had not been confirmed. But uh, once, I, uh, once I, I did become the permanent IG, I, I never missed a year uh, of doing the keynote address to HCCA, uh, regardless of, of you know, whether I thought I had a bundle of really important things to share or not. Uh, having the flag there and dealing uh, on the ground with people whose, whose job it is uh, to make compliance a reality uh, for such a wide range of healthcare providers um, was was a very important, very important part of the job. And the council's office has always felt that way. Uh, got a lot of support for it. Uh, you know, they, I think they felt, hopefully, that uh, I was supporting them. I certainly felt that they were supporting me. Well, so I, I'm sure sorry- the theme that seems to run through uh, the establishment of the, uh, at least part of the agenda for the IG, uh, does come from Congress, legislative initiatives, and what that legislation uh, instructs uh, the, the IG to do. So when we when we read legislative history and we read the content. Of, of legislation, um, it's not just something to uh, discard. I mean, the relevant agencies uh, have to pay attention to that, right? Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, I mean, I, I guess if you don't, you'll probably be answering to Congress as to what happened. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm old-fashioned enough to think that uh, an executive, and I have thought this way through the half dozen executive agencies that I've been involved with at a managerial level. Executive agency is not free to do what it wants uh, just because it thinks it's a good idea, that uh, your actions really need to be anchored in legislation. Um, and you know, some administrations have been a little bit more relaxed about that than others, perhaps, but I think that would be a topic for a different webinar uh, and a, one much longer. Uh, yeah. But I, I think it's critical that you be able to refer back to the statute and say, we're doing this pursuant to this statute. So, um, Dan, uh, we, we, at least in my, in my um, opinion, we've, we've probably spent a good, oh, maybe 20 years in uh, growing uh, 
leadership and development uh, of compliance oversight in healthcare organizations. Um, certainly, uh, that development has been um, uh, led and induced by the leadership of the Office of Inspector General. Um, it's certainly been necessitated by the acute whistleblower risk uh, that has existed in the healthcare industry since about the early 90s, mid 90s, uh, and, and also just the sentinel effect of um, uh, fairly pervasive uh, healthcare fraud enforcement, uh, criminal, civil, or administrative on, on both the federal and, and, and the state level. Um, do you have any uh, opinion about whether what impact this has had uh, one way or the other, but but I guess maybe most importantly in in reducing the level of fraud, uh, which I've heard stated anecdotally is responsible for anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of the uh, healthcare uh, uh, gross national product. You know, so. <laughs> Yeah, Is there any way to measure the effect that we've had? You know, it's it's a uh, it's a very uh, important question, and it's one that, in one form or another, uh, I have uh, have thought about uh, really over the course of my entire tenure. Is how do you quantify uh, what you're doing here? Since uh, you know so much, uh, especially in government, uh, uh, and I guess it's true in the private sector as well. Uh, needs to be quantified uh, in order to be able to demonstrate value. Uh, like I know, I can tell you, my my last year as IG, uh, the the IG's office uh, was able to report over two, I think over two billion dollars in judgments and settlements. Um, but as to as to how you quantify this compliance effort, I can uh, I can only say that it is. It is critical to the to the success of the IG mission uh, that there be a robust effort uh, on the part of of uh, of all healthcare providers uh, to do the compliance work. Uh, you can see it in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is, and I think that uh, very often OSIG, uh, the council's office at IG, reflects this, is that. Private industry has a responsibility. Uh, in a sense, it's a shared responsibility. The HHS IG uh, works to ensure compliance, and uh, the providers need to ensure compliance because those federal ta tax dollars leave HHS and wind up with providers, and providers need to ensure compliance. Um, a very important consideration for me. I thought is uh, is that the HHS IG is relatively small, uh, although it's the largest IG in government. It is, uh, it, you know, we have fewer than sixteen hundred or so people for a one point three trillion dollar portfolio. When you work that out on a per capita basis, you know, every auditor uh, is accountable for billions of dollars, and it's pretty impractical for even four or 500 investigators to be able to cover the field. Um, so I, I, think, I think it's important uh, that, we, that we take into account that it's not only a responsibility of providers uh, to be able to, uh, to ensure compliance, but it serves a, a, a great, it, it, it does the government uh, a great favor in effect by uh, supplementing uh, the resources uh, that are available to ensure compliance. I mean, you can almost think of it as a three-pronged effort. Uh, providers themselves are supposed to be able to uh, provide the, uh, you know, the kind of compliance assurance through their internal controls. Uh, you have, in effect, private attorneys general or private inspectors general through the False Claims Act and the key TAM provisions. You know, your uh, the employee down the hall is is also looking to see uh, whether there's whether there's compliance. And as to the HHS IG, because our resources are modest, uh, I always thought that it was it was a great assistance to the IG's office in being able to to extend uh, its reach 
by making sure that, uh, to the extent possible, that providers are doing what they can to, in effect, relieve the HHSIG of the responsibility of looking through every corner of our Medicare and Medicaid system, which, as a practical matter, it really can't do. So as a, as a, as a matter of practice for me over the years, and I think I did it every year from the time I, I made my first appearance at HCCA in 2006 to the last time in 2018, I, uh, I thank the uh, compliance officers. And there, there are a lot of people to thank because those conferences uh, bring together two to 3,000 people in the field across all of the ranges of, uh, of, of healthcare providers, you know, hospitals, nursing homes, pharmaceutical companies, the entire wide range. And I always made it a point to thank the officers there for the work they were doing to help ensure compliance. And I got my fill of stories uh, from many compliance officers about how challenging it was to work this portfolio at their healthcare enterprise, because lots of, uh, lots of them don't get the kind of support from the front office that, speaking as, as the IG at the time, uh, I was hoping that they would get. Um, in in many corners of the field, there's there's really not a, a high level of commitment and of respect uh, for the uh, for the professional compliance officers. Um, there weren't the resources necessarily devoted uh, to that component that were really required uh, in order for those folks to do the kind of job they needed to do. And it, frankly, it was reflected in their in their own personal attitudes and personal feelings about what they were doing. Uh, year after year, uh, HCCA would have surveys of compliance officers in which it would be revealed that uh, there was a very high stress level that um, these compliance officers had. Uh, that between the uh, the risks that were present and the lack of support. Uh, from top management, uh, that it was a it was a very very challenging environment within which to do the kind of good job uh, so many of them wanted to do, and that probably attributes uh, that is a, uh, probably one of the reasons why you don't get um, a lot of long term compliance officers uh, in in some corners of the healthcare field. The turnover uh, can be relatively rapid, and that's especially uh, difficult uh, for uh, for the field because again we we deal with a regulatory complexity um, that benefits uh, from those who would be really experienced um, in in the field. I understand there's a there's a question about what determines whether a U.S. attorney or main justice handles an investigation. Um, that that's that's a very interesting question uh, concerning how the Department of Justice, uh, you know, divides up its portfolio. As as m most, if not all, of you know, the Inspector General uh, does not have standing to show up in federal court on behalf of the United States. Uh, we are an investigative unit uh, of the government. Uh, the IG is not the prosecutor. Uh, so it's it's terribly important that there be a real hand in glove relationship between uh, the OIG and DOJ. Uh, the way in which DOJ deals with the relative responsibilities of Maine Justice and the, I think it's ninety four separate United States Attorney offices, is something really within the purview of DOJ and. It can vary with administration and the way in which offices are are, are structured. Uh, there is an executive office uh, within the front office of DOJ that oversees U.S. attorney operations. But by and large, uh, these U.S. attorney offices are also very independent, and they're independent of main justice as well. Um, the Civil Fraud Division and the Criminal Division uh, have laid out over the years the contours of the kinds of cases uh, that they feel uh, should be handled by Maine Justice. 
And things can, you know, sometimes uh, be negotiated, I suspect, between Maine Justice and the U.S. attorneys. But U- U.S. attorneys have have the independence of being able to select cases, at least within their jurisdiction, within their field, and then, um, you know, tackle those cases as they see fit. Uh, at times, there will be um, challenges for the OIG uh, to deal with as a result of this split responsibility between Maine Justice and the U.S. Attorney. Uh, you know, in some cases, right. a U.S. attorney may not want to actually engage with the task force responsibilities of OIG. So then, you know, I, I had more than one conversation, Gabe, with a U.S. attorney. In By current- the way, Dan, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. I'm Okay, I'm going to hang up now. Thank okay. you. You know, there was there was oh, yeah. more there was more than a couple of cases where you know I wound up jawboning with the U.S. Attorney about being more active with the task force in its particular region, and it was clear that the U.S. Attorney had other ideas about how to use his resources. So you know, there can be conflicts both sometimes I suspect jurisdictionally between main justice and U.S. attorneys. There also can be differences about how to address the healthcare fraud portfolio between OIG and individual U.S. attorney offices. Was that in response to a question, Dan? I see one up here. Yeah, about um, you know who decides between a U.S. attorney or main justice handling an investigation. Yes. Um, I, I think that what the question is getting to is handling the case. I mean, the yeah. IG investigation um, is delivered uh, to uh, either Maine Justice or to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, there are also, also are significant investigations through the FBI that happen within Maine Justice, so that uh, the IG, uh, if it's if the IG is involved, the IG may be involved tangentially. So. Uh, to answer specifically the question about who decides, U.S. attorney or main justice, it's really something that's negotiated within the Department of Justice. So, Dan, I, I got uh, punched out of our presentation here. I think we were talking about uh, healthcare organization compliance oversight and whether there was uh, some measurement of what impact that had on the uh, incidents and proliferation of healthcare fraud. Um, did you get a chance to elaborate on that, or is there something more we can discuss about that? No, I, I have been discussing, Gabe, at, uh, at maybe more length than it deserves, the, uh, the challenges that exist in being able to have a robust uh, c- compliance regime uh, that works for healthcare providers uh, when you don't necessarily have uh, support from the front office, from top management, um, and the importance of the HHSIG uh, being able to be as supportive as possible, both in terms of resources and making people available for a lot of the information and education efforts that I'm very proud to say uh, happened uh, once we had the resources post-ACA and there were dollars um, that were dedicated uh, to spreading the word uh, about compliance. And uh, we, we did a very robust job, I remember, in 2011, 2012, 2013, when the resources were available, going out to the field. Uh, and much of the, uh, the person-to-person benefit of educating people about compliance that was done then uh, have been captured in videos that are, to this day, on the HHS OIG website. So I would encourage uh, any viewer or listener who, who hasn't had occasion to look uh, to, to go on to the HHS IG website and uh, click through to the compliance portal uh, because there are video presentations. There still might be one from me for all I know, uh, but there, there are some very good presentations done by uh, both investigators and counsel and evaluators, a number of uh, people at HHS uh, that uh, really provides a good 
firm foundation for understanding the principles of healthcare compliance. You know, um, now that you mentioned that, uh, I, I don't know if you had, had mentioned the a publication of the vary, various uh, compliance program guidances uh, back about 10 years ago, but um, I always uh, uh, state to uh, compliance professionals that if they are looking to establish uh, their their agenda, you know, from year to year, and and prioritizing uh, certain risk areas uh, for their organization, uh, that they should look at at uh, the very items that you just mentioned. Uh, in particular, the compliance program guidance that are applicable to their particular segment of the industry. Because the, the risks identified in those guidances and, and the structure to manage that risk uh, outlined in those guidances is, you know, as far as I can tell, still current today and, and useful. In addition, I, I also say, you know, I would pull an array of the whistleblower false claims act cases and settlements that have occurred uh, uh, where uh, your particular type of organization is mm -hmm. uh, is a defendant in in one of those cases, uh, or or is a party that has settled one of those cases, uh, because a, a lot of the um, uh, while there are different features to the kind of fraud we see, the underlying activity doesn't change that much. Uh, over time, and it, it tends to get repeated. Um, I, I mean, I can remember 20 years ago, uh, enforcement uh, sitting on uh, questionable lab arrangements, okay? Mm -hmm. And and yet I still see those same arrangements today in, you know, in, in some other place with, with maybe a different type of lab, but it's the, it's, you know, it's the same stuff. You know, it's, it's interesting you mentioned labs, Gabe, because I think that might have been the first compliance program guidance that was that was issued back in around 98. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, these CPGs, uh, and I think it did begin with labs, um, really had a pretty much covered the waterfront uh, by 2003, 2004, when I came into office. I am pleased uh, that in several cases, there were uh, supplementary uh, issuances, uh, ways of modernizing or refining the original CPGs that occurred, I'd say the first four or five years in, into my tenure. So I, it's, you know, to the credit of counsel's office, I think the CPGs from the turn of the century are not only overall quite, quite useful to this day, but uh, in several cases, they've also been, if necessary or if indicated, updated uh, so that they're, um, although none of them are really recent, uh, they, they really remain good, you know, keystone kinds of resources um, to, be, uh, to be available on your desk. Absolutely. By the way, let, let me uh, remind the uh, listeners uh, that if you do have uh, any questions, uh, please uh, post them uh, on the uh, questions board uh, so they'll come up and we see them because we will have some time uh, to take questions before uh, we wrap up things in, in about 20 minutes. Um, so, Dan, uh, you know, I, that, that question about uh, what determines whether the U.S. attorney or main justice handles the investigation, I heard you talking uh, a little bit about um, you know, different uh, components of DOJ or even even in the agency or otherwise may have a, sort of a different approach to uh, enforcement matters and disposition of those enforcement matters. You know, that's certainly been borne out by my own experience. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I can I can have a healthcare fraud case, a criminal healthcare fraud case with the same activity in one district uh, that's handled one way and in a, in another district it's handled you know in a, in a completely different way and, well, and know, the, the dialogue with the US attorney's office can be completely different and uh, it's 
you know, I'm, I don't have an editorial comment for that exactly, but I think it's a point that uh, those practitioners who are in the compliance field, in the enforcement and defense area, uh, really need to know that, um, you know, it, there can be differences from component to component. You know, th that's, that's a very important insight. And it was actually on my agenda to ask you the question uh, for you to be the interviewee here on your experiences as to whether DOJ operates as one DOJ or, or, or not. I mean, one of the most important initiatives I thought during my tenure was the promotion of one OIG and yeah. the efforts to, because IG personnel are around the country. In fact, when I came in, it was an office policy to have an IG office in every state of the union. Uh, that's no longer the case. It was it really uh, was impractical even back then, and it's even less necessary today. But, you know, with so many people out, the majority of OIG personnel at HHS are not in Washington. They're, they're in Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, and so forth. And, you know, a lot happens locally that's different in different locations when you think about CMS and the way they operate. And it was an important initiative at the HHS IG uh, to think in terms of, you know, let's, let's operate as a national program to the fullest extent that we can. And what was interesting to me was we were operating as a national program. DOJ was, uh, you know, could be different along the lines that you just mentioned. Yeah. Well, I, you know, in answer to your question, um, you know, I'm going back a number of years, but may, maybe more recently, um, you know, I I settled the case not too long ago uh, with a, a particular U.S. Attorney's Office, and um, it, it was I, I I don't think it was a wonderful experience for uh, our clients because they ended up pleading and getting convicted of a kickback violation. <laughs> Uh, but but it was a pretty good experience for my partners and I in working with uh, the U.S. attorneys, uh, the assistant U.S. attorneys in that U.S. attorney's office to uh, accomplish uh, what we knew could be accomplished in a case like that and what they wanted to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward about six months later uh, with the... Uh, you know, same U.S. Attorney's Office where uh, the DOJ criminal fraud section is involved now with that U.S. Attorney's hmm. Office, whereas before only the U.S. Attorney's Office was involved. Yeah. Um, similar type of case became a little bit different handling experience. Yeah. And a little bit different agenda. And, and I, you know, my only point is, is for our listeners to know that, you know, it, it that can make a difference. And there's no book that you find out about this uh, un unless you basically have the experience of. Uh, you know, it, it's a useful reminder that the 94 or so United States attorneys are also presidential appointees. These are political yeah. appointees. They're civil officers. And um, technically, they serve four year terms if you read the commission. Uh, but very often they, uh, they're allowed for one reason or another to stay on. But, yeah, these U.S. attorneys also have a sense of independence, uh, um, even from main justice. Uh, so it, it does it, it creates a very it's a very nuanced situation. You know, for most of the executive branch, it's a pretty much pyramid command and control top down kind of situation. People usually know who their superiors are and who their subordinates are. But with respect to DOJ responsibilities and how they're exercised by various officers over there, it's, it's, a, um, it's something that needs to be thought through anew uh, every time you, know, you have a case that might involve different offices and different personalities. Yeah. Um, just to go back to uh, measuring the impact of uh, organizational compliance. Um, you know, I don't know of any numerical measures that are out there really that, that uh, 
ha have great meaning. But um, I, I do have an anecdotal measure in 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 the sense of how my my own personal practice has has changed over the last ten years. Um, ten years ago and before, you know, when we talked about healthcare fraud, uh, we talked about defending criminal, civil, and administrative enforcement actions, basically, mm -hmm. and you know, resolving them, defending them, whatever. But um, about 10 years ago, that, that started to change, and, and the change was precipitated by the proliferation of resources being devoted to uh, organizational compliance in the healthcare organizations and the creation of compliance departments and compliance staff uh, to to address compliance issues as they arise uh, in the organization, you know whether that's from an internal report of non-compliant activity or an external report of mm -hmm. non-compliant activity, and and that started to um, create a demand for lawyering that that I eventually uh, named compliance lawyering, mm -hmm. and and the features of that, you, you know, it's not that that. That role is not defending a criminal, civil, or administrative enforcement action. Uh, you know, that can be part of that lawyer's portfolio, but the compliance lawyer ends up working with the organization and, and oftentimes their compliance department, the chief compliance officer, the general counsel's office in, in managing and addressing and resolving compliance risk. Uh, in the best way that that experience can bring to bear to to do that, you know, sometimes some of the things you end up doing is uh, directing an internal investigation of a report of non-compliant activity, uh, determining what the facts are, uh, so that you can uh, fashion a remedy. Um, other times, that will also be uh, uh, guiding the organization. Uh, through a self-disclosure process to resolve that liability uh, if, if it's otherwise hanging out there to be taken advantage of by, say, a whistleblower, okay? Um, of course, uh, nuanced advice about compliance matters, uh, knowing how to advise a client about whether, you, you know, like, for example, a, a lot of stark issues will come up in an organization that has a relatively mature compliance program. And the Stark Law is a law that, you know, uh, has some important uh, facets to it. Uh, it's a strict liability statute. There's no intent uh, requirement. Uh, there are exceptions, you're either in or out, uh, but it does pose a fairly significant uh, risk and liability for, for organizations because uh, the law is counterintuitive, and there's many ways that a clever lawyer can poke holes in your mm -hmm. compliance with that law. Okay, so but what ends up coming up through the ranks in in a mature organization with a compliance program will be these questions about compliance with the Stark Law uh, that will arise from operational people who have just a basic understanding of what the law might prohibit. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with a proliferation of issues where, and some of the issues, you know, are orbiting Earth and the Star Law, and other issues are orbiting some other planet with some yeah. kind of tenuous connection to the Star Law. And, and, and I have found that sometimes organizations um, uh, get stuck with that. They, they don't know how to move past the report to a nuanced evaluation of the application of the Stark Law and whether it's a real risk or more of an imaginary risk. Mm -hmm. you know? And and there's only, you know, I, I, I personally believe there's maybe a dozen true Stark experts in the country outside of the government people who are responsible yeah. for it. And, and you, you, you know, these, the kind of advice for Healthcare organizations, the nuanced advice in, in in situations like that can be invaluable. And if they don't if they don't have it, uh, they end up um, creating more problems than they resolve. 
with their mature compliance programs. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And and given the high level of risk, and, and Stark is, is perhaps the best, certainly a very good example. Uh, what comes to my mind um, is, uh, I think it was just this past summer that the Justice Department did an update of its Sentencing Commission guidelines and on, on compliance and the importance of compliance and looking to how the enterprise uh, handled compliance. And I'm thinking, you know, if I'm a chief, if I'm a general counsel, a corporate general counsel, I'd have trouble sleeping at night, you know, not if, if I didn't know that I had put in place a compliance regime that looks strong you know, so that I and mean, things go wrong, no matter what you do in in large enterprises, so that you know you're you're playing a, a, a smart defense at probably you know not that high a cost, but if you you know if you guess wrong by not paying attention, uh, as you know, the consequences are so severe that when I met Pete Stark on the hill early in my tenure. Uh, he said, you know, the law is not operating the way I intended it. It's okay if you call it the Levinson Law. I mean, even <laughs> he wanted to draw distance between himself and Stark. But uh, it is what it is. And we're, you know, we, we need to try to work uh, as, effective, as effectively as we can to protect against the legitimate risks, the, the, you know, the, the legitimate problems that were identified by Stark uh, in something of a new era now. I, I just think let's that, talk about that a little bit. We we have initiatives, um, uh, 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 value based uh, payments, um, moving away from volume to, to value and, and value measurements, telemedicine, and and some of our traditional fraud healthcare fraud laws, the kickback statute, the Stark law. Uh, you know. A, on my side of the table are seen as potential impediments to developments in those areas. What do, what do you, what, what do you see in that area? Well, Gabe, it's not only you, it's, it's quite a few others. I mean, the, the, you know, those in the healthcare bar have identified this as a significant um, issue, you know, for them to deal effectively um, for their clients. And, um, when I stepped down, actually in the spring of 2019, there were a couple of lawyers who I think were quoted in BNA uh, saying, you know, we, we'd like to see OIG move more robustly uh, in this area to uh, open up the coordinated and in integrated accountable care operations uh, with, uh, without the burdens of uh, these anti-fraud provisions that really make it very difficult to both operate in a coordinated way and yet still maintain some kind of arm's length relationship. Yeah. I mean, in so many respects, the late 20th century, uh, you know, structure that was put in place uh, to protect these programs are, are relatively crude instruments. I mean, it's true that kickbacks can be a problem, but you also know that kickbacks exist in a lot of other industries and fields and aren't necessarily identified. As right. a problem, but but in this in this context, you know, can you handle things like self referrals and kickbacks in a in a way that um, can maximize the, the value proposition of people acting in concert with each other uh, without opening the door to gaming? Uh, you know, that would rob the program of the value of healthcare dollars, and the answer. I don't have off the top of my head. The answer is plainly in the IT um, development that has been unfolding over the past decade and a half, basically over the time that I came in in the 2000s. And now, uh, if there's anything that I've seen that has real dynamism to it, in which the environment changes every year without fail, and there are new developments that are both positive in terms of being able to use data uh, really effectively to deliver and to pay for healthcare in ways that look a whole lot, a whole lot more sensible than the paper process of years past, and also present new threats, whether it's security, you know, cybersecurity, or whether it's safety, uh, uh, privacy, 
um, it's it, it's a uh, it's a very complicated you know kind of environment in which to make sure that you get the benefits without dragging along new problems that you then have to deal with. And this is something that I encouraged and really insisted that the senior staff at the HHS OIG grapple with. And we had sessions over the last several years of my tenure of senior staff uh, to talk about you know, how to deal uh, most effectively with um, healthcare fraud in a new environment. Uh, that uh, that's not going to be based so much on uh, these 20th century type of instruments that are simply too blunt, uh, too crude, and too impractical in in some respects to be able to operate as if you know things haven't changed. The yeah. answer has been in the recent past to add more safe harbors, to add more exceptions, to include waivers. You know, we began the decade in the ACA under Title III with the new ACO models with fraud waivers. And uh, CMS would look to HHS OIG uh, to bless certain models that waivers would be provided uh, for these laws. And sometimes OIG could give a thumbs up based on the history of the enterprise. And other times the IG would give the thumbs down. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we began the decade with, with adding yet more complication uh, to these laws, and we're ending the decade. I'm thinking about the CARES Act and all of the new fraud waivers uh, that are now uh, being, um, you know, that now need to be understood in the context of, I'm sure, your clients and clients around the country. Um, waivers are good short term solutions. But I do think that the field is in the process of evolution. And as I said earlier, so much depends on legislation. You need the legislation. And that's why I said to Stark, no, it's not the Levinson law, it's the Stark law. (laughs) And until the Stark law changes, it's it's going to be the Stark law. (laughs) Well, uh, we're we're dwindling down in in our time. Uh, It's almost uh, 140. Um, One last item that that I want to discuss in the couple of minutes that we have um, the oh and and for you listeners uh, the written materials uh, do contain the Office of Inspector General self disclosure protocol uh, established in 1998 and then uh, tweaked in uh, 2013 uh, with some features that hadn't uh, existed prior to that. Um, and uh, did, what was your role in 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 the the evolution of the self disclosure protocol? How did how did that come about? That that we took another crack at it to refine it in 2013. Well, when I arrived in 2005, it kind of got presented to me pretty early on. I was not familiar uh, with the system, but I was presented, of course, with the foundation protocol from the uh, from the Gibbs Brown era as well as uh, what Janet Rehnquist had signed in 2001. And there was a feeling that uh, this self-disclosure protocol process wasn't being utilized, maximized, as it were, in the way it should be. I mean, keep in mind that, again, given limited resources, there's a need to buttress by having self-disclosure. So in open letters starting in 2006, early in my tenure, and then a couple more I I work with staff to try to relax and try to liberalize uh, this uh, this operation to incentivize providers to come forward, knowing that there's simply no way for an office of the size of HHSIG to police the 1.3 trillion dollar Medicare. Well, Medicare. and and the features that that were added to the protocol uh, were were two very important features. One was that. Um, Upon acceptance to entry into the protocol, the IG uh, made a commitment up front that the assessment of damages would only, single damages would only be multiplied by 1.5 uh, uh, in contrast to, uh, you would be talking doubles in, in other forums. Right. And also the other commitment was that uh, 
there would be no corporate integrity obligations imposed upon an organization, all other things being equal that, that made a self-disclosure. Uh, the, the last thing I'll say about that is, um, uh, I, I, I don't know if you foresaw this when that development was made, but this is the only portal for self-disclosure that exists where, there, where you can look at it and there's a prior commitment. Mm -hmm. And, and for, for me to be able to say to clients that, look, if we go into this door, uh, these are some of the, 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 the incentives that you have to do it. And they're, they're posted. You can read it. This is how you'll be treated. Uh, plus a little other, um, you know, inside baseball that you can advise yeah. the client about, about going through using the OIG self-disclosure -dis protocol made it so much easier. I, I mean, clients are still sort of, they, they, they don't know what that means exactly, yeah. but it's a lot easier to explain to them with those features than the sort of like, well, you just walk in the door and you take your chances. Yeah. There's no real rules and you see what you can negotiate. So. That's uh, very well, gratifying to hear. Very well, gratifying. with that, we're we're out of our time. Um, uh, appreciate everybody uh, paying attention. Sorry for the snafu, technical snafu that eliminated me from part of the discussion, but I appreciate you, Dan, carrying on there. Uh, uh, with that, we'll wrap it up. I do want to say that uh, within 15 minutes, uh, for those of you who are interested, you can join our next set session, which is. False Claims Act developments moderated by uh, John Diesenhaus from the Hogan Lovells firm. I think you'll find that uh, very useful, uh, especially if uh, you practice in the area of the False Claims Act. Uh, with that, I'll sign off and say thank you to everyone. And Dan, thank you. Thank you.